All right, good morning um, and welcome to um, our webinar today on the challenges and strategies for promoting awareness of open and accessible educational resources. And um, w this webinar is part of our Open Education Week 2014, so um, thank you for joining us to celebrate this. And thank you to our presenters, um, Ann Taylor from National Federation of the Blind and Jerry Hanley from the California State University Chancellor's Office. Um, we have a lot of uh, good information to share today and we, we would, we're looking forward to your feedback um, on this material as well. Uh, very briefly, uh, we're using the Blackboard Collaborate system here of the California Community College system. So thank you for that. Um, and on the left-hand side, you should see a chat window and a, a participants list. Uh, you should see yourself in that list. And you may use the chat window at any time to provide us with comments or questions. We'll do our best to answer questions as we go along in the chat window. But we'll hold the main body of the questions till the end of the hour. And we plan to finish up a little early so that we can get a lot of those questions in. Uh, today's agenda, uh, we're going to uh, start out with a little bit of open education definitions and accessibility needs, uh, which may be an overview of information that uh, some of you already know, but because Open Education Week is really an outreach effort to beyond professional educators, uh, to folks around the world, um, I wanted to kind of start the discussion at that level. And then we're going to have a presentation from the National Federation of the Blind with Ann Taylor talking about making the 21st century campus a model of accessibility. And finally, our, our, our third pre pre presentation will be from Jerry Hanley at the California State University Chancellor's Office on accessibility OER and improving services for students with disabilities. And then we'll have Q&A. At this time, um, I want to once again invite uh, those of you who haven't introduced yourself in the chat window to go ahead and do that. And now I'm going to um, give our presenters um, just a brief moment here to tell us a little bit about themselves and um, why this uh, topic is of importance to them today. And Anne, I'm going to let you start with that. This is Ann Taylor, Director of Access Technology at the National Federation of the Blind. Thank you very much. Uh, I I'm delighted to be here today. This topic is extremely important to me because I was once a college student who struggled to gain access to education in, in, in my college. It shall remain unnamed. Uh, I know that uh, the college that I attended uh, is trying to do the right thing now. However, it's, it's, this is the experience that I don't wish on anyone. And for example, I, I was studying computer science, uh, and I actually didn't get uh, my database book until two weeks until the end of the semester. So that was a tough goal for me. So I would like to change this, and the National Federation of the Bond has given me the vehicle to be able to contribute in this space, and I'm absolutely loving it. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. Um, I'm going to ask you um, to speak up a little bit when we get to your presentation. It was just a little quiet. I hope most people were able to hear you. And I thank you for sharing um, your story about um, the struggles you had in college as a student with um, disabilities and how it, that is improving now. Um, but I know that there's more room to go for that. And yes. next I'd like to introduce, go ahead, Anne. That's it. Thank you. Oh, okay, thank you. And next I'd like to introduce Jerry Hanley, who is the Assistant Vice Chancellor at the California State University System, and he's also the Executive Director of Merlot. Uh, thank you, Linda, and uh, thank you, Ann. Um, it's great to be here on, on this panel, and um, in the California State University System, we have almost 450,000 students, and over 12,000 of our students are registered with our Centers for Services for Students with Disabilities. And so accessibility has to be our forethought and not an afterthought for all our educational programs. And at the Cal State system, 
through our accessible technology initiative, which I'll highlight a little bit later on, um, it really is uh, becomes a priority for us to ensure every student has equally effective access to a quality learning experience. And then within Merlot, uh, our job since 1997 has to ensure that all students have access to quality educational materials uh, through our services and partnering with other people. And it's great working here with Anne and Una on this topic. All right, thank you, Jerry. And uh, once again, I, I'm Una Daly, the Community College Outreach Director at the Open Courseware Consortium. Um, and I'm just thrilled to be here with Anne and Jerry, who are such experts on this topic. Um, I just wanted to briefly tell you that the Open Courseware Consortium has been um, dedicated also to accessibility. Um, it, a core value of open access is expanding access for our students, and um, we we want to ensure that um, OER is is is, is as accessible as possible for students and learners throughout the world. And in my work with community colleges. We've looked at statistics around students uh, with disabilities and diverse students. And of the public and private post-secondary systems, we enroll um, the highest percentage of students who report a uh, disability um, of, of all the systems. And so this is really um, a very important issue for us at community colleges as well. And now, <laughs> I'd like to go ahead and, and give you a brief overview around um, some of the work being done um, at uh, the Community College Consortium, the Open Courseware, um, and, and to talk in general about open ed. So open educational resources. Uh, the Department of Education, who's uh, been very supportive of OER um, in recent years, defines it as teaching, learning, and research resources that reside in the public domain or have been released under an intellectual property license that permits their free reuse or repurposing by others. So an open license um, allows um, materials to be reused, revised, uh, remixed, and redistributed. And why this is so important uh, for accessibility is that it allows a faculty or curriculum developers to uh, modify existing resources that uh, may not have been uh, originally um, made accessible. So for instance, if there's openly licensed videos that you want to bring into your classroom but they don't have captions, if that open license means that you, as an adopter of that uh, uh, video, can actually add captions freely without worrying about uh, copyright restriction. And we use the Creative Commons license um, to do this kind of um, work with open educational resources. So examples of, of open educational resources really run the gamut from textbooks, open courses, open videos, such as the Khan Academy. Um, really, it's any tools, materials, or techniques that are used to support ready access to knowledge. And once again, the characteristics of OER really have a lot of promise for uh, being accessible to learners with disabilities and diverse needs. Um, they start out digital, um, which makes them easier to customize and free, free to distribute over the internet. That open license, once again, allows reuse and revision, so modifications if need be, translations as well, uh, where language differences occur. And the no or low cost really expands access to education, not only for students where affordability is an issue, but for students um, who may have um, special needs. But in fact, we find that um, a digital resource plus an open license doesn't guarantee accessibility. It certainly makes it possible, but um, in working in, in this area, we, we realize that um, curriculum developers, faculty, staff, and students all need to be aware um, of what it takes to make digital resources accessible. Um, 
sometimes when I do workshops with faculty, um, they, they will ask, how necessary is it for, for my materials to be accessible? Well, legally, of course, that's required in the United States under the American for, with Disabilities Act. But if you look at the numbers worldwide, approximately a billion um, people have some form of disability. And we know that it has a disproportionate effect on their health, education, employment, and poverty levels. In the United States, 11% um, of post-secondary students report disabilities. And many experience accessibility barriers. So we know that there is a lot of work for us to do here. There's many treaties and laws that have come into play in the last 25 to 30 years. Um, to support uh, the rights of persons with disabilities. Uh, probably the, the largest, most international one is the United Nations Convention on Rights of Persons with Disabilities that was adopted in 2006. And to date, it's been ratified by 141 countries. Um, I mentioned here just a couple of other ones. Um, the United Kingdom Equality Act, which most recently was revised in 2010. Of course, the Americans with Disabilities Act of 1990 has had a huge effect on how we work in education um, with learners. And um, there, many other countries have um, laws as well. So when we're talking about diverse learner challenges or students with disabilities, we kind of put it into four categories. Um, and, um, the, and these refer to us learners who have cognitive learning disabilities. So uh, this would be a brain functioning issue. And as uh, brain research science over the last 20, 30 years has um, advanced, we're, we're finding out more about um, how to help students with cognitive learning disabilities. A uh, second category would be sensory or motor impairments, which I think are the ones that often come to mind when we first think about diverse learner challenges. So this would be vision and hearing impairment and obviously mobility uh, concerns. Uh, language deficits is another one that is considered in the same category. And this may be uh, students who um, are um, studying the language of the country they're in, it may be a second language for them. Uh, here in the United States, that's often English as a second language. Uh, so students who come in uh, in a different language. And, um, and finally, lack of engagement. And we find that with uh, learners with diverse learning styles, um, disabilities, they are often there's a lack of engagement with the curriculum. Uh, it doesn't because it isn't addressing their needs. So at the Open Courseware, um, our accessibility goals are improving learning for all learners, and that is through universal and inclusive design. We want to help curriculum developers understand how to design OER to be accessible up front so that we're not retrofitting if possible. Um, and we want to empower faculty adopters to have the uh, knowledge to evaluate OER um, and then adapt it if need be to be accessible. So once again, I mentioned the video captions for faculty who might want to adopt an openly licensed video without captions. Um, we want to empower them to know that they can do that. And finally, we're building a community of practice. And um, uh, we have many partners, uh, Merlot, the Inclusive Design Center, the National Federation of the Blind, um, Open University, and um, we invite you to join us as well. So very briefly, our design and guidelines around this is the universal design for learning, which provides multiple means of expression, representation, and engagement to support uh, different styles. Uh, from the W3C uh, consortium, uh, the web content access guidelines um, give us um, a, a matrix of ways to determine accessibility. Um, the Community College Consortium for OER uh, did an open textbook accessibility review several years ago, and we used those standards from the Web Content Access Guidelines to um, evaluate textbooks on their accessibility. And those are available through the collegeopentextbooks.org site and also through Merlot. And so we invite you to uh, take a look at those. 
And finally, um, we are working with Merlot and the National Federation for the Blind to build an online community. And uh, the, the website address is up there. And um, we invite you to participate with us. And I will put that in our chat window. Thank you for listening. And um, now I would like to turn this over to Ann Taylor from the National Federation for the Blind. Thank you, Yuna. Thank you, everybody. Uh, Yuna, I'm going to actually ask you to be, uh, go to the next slide for me when I'm ready. I'm just going to say next slide as a cue. So I okay. would I would appreciate um, any question that you may have along the way, and please feel free to ask them. And we'll, we'll I'll, I'm sure Yuna will make sure that I get it. Um, so please uh, be uh, participative, and I'm wel welcoming all the questions and comments. From, from the audience. Um, first of all, I would like to say that I appreciate so much the opportunity to be able to be here with you today. And this is, as I mentioned early on, a topic that I'm really passionate about. Um, I just want to let you know that uh, for those of you who are willing to embrace accessibility in a big way and have every intention to follow through, that you're not working in the vacuum. You are not working in isolation of any any source. We have people of your peers who have successfully have done the right thing. Uh, we have uh, the blind community, especially the members of the National Federation of the Blind, myself and my team, and uh, we're supportive of what you're what you are doing and what you are trying to accomplish and achieve as far as accessibility in implementation is concerned. But let let me talk uh, about the National Federation of the Blind because the heart of what I do here only comes from the support that I have from my fellow blind citizens uh, in this country. The National Federation of the Blind really is founded in the 1940. We are the largest and oldest organization of blind people. We have affiliates in every state. D.C. and Puerto Rico is included. We also have special interest divisions, just as such as a computer science division and engineering division. And we also have, you know, we, we have been working hard on advocating for STEM accessibility. So we want more blind students to get into computer science fields. We want more blind uh, engineering students to succeed in engineering fields. And you can see the, the the continuous theme here, we have also a strong student division. Many of you, uh, many of your campus around across this country probably have blind students there. And many of them will probably become, are, are a member of the National Federation of the Blind Student Division. And if they are, please reach out to them. This comment I'm going to make next is for procurement officer. Please reach out to your blind student on your campus before you decide on one particular education technology to see whether it is going to work well on your campus or not. We're going to talk about how to properly evaluate the technology and determine whether which one will be accessible or not. But uh, standards and everything else aside, you've got to make sure that those technologies are usable by the blind, by real people who use access technology. So I would recommend that you would please reach out to your students. NFB provides vehicle for collective action by the blind. And if we drive innovation through practical experience of the blind, and this is really important. We are an organization who want to share um, the success and share best practice. This is why NFB resources is so uh, valuable to, to each and every one of you. And I'm, after this webinar, I'm, I'm reachable. And please uh, keep the dialogue coming because I'm going to be learning from you, and you will hopefully continue to learn from me. Next slide, please. As I mentioned early on, that we, um, we love to share experience. And we have to have uh, an institute that embody all of our experience and uh, make it all practical in a real way. The NFB Jernigan Institute is part of the National Federation of the Blind. And the NFB Jernigan Institute leads uh, the quest to understanding the real problem of blindness. 
and to develop an innovative education technology products and services that will help the world blind achieve independence. We are the only research and training institute directed by the blind. Two important initiatives that I want to call to your attention today uh, because of the time constraints are research and development and support of commercial and support the commercialization of technology for meeting the need of the blind. Improve non-visual access to and use of information through innovation technologies and braille education. We are not afraid of pushing the boundary in technology development. NFB has been a leader in technology development for decades. The reason that we have a um, flatbed scanner uh, on your, each of your desktop to scan computer, uh, to scan photos, I mean, is because the work that Dr. Jernigan, uh, the president of the NFB then, and Dr. Kurzweil worked together. For the first time, uh, just a little historical perspective here, um, the uh, OCR reading machine was first created for the use of the blind. And in that OCR machine, three technologies were integrated together. Things like speech synthesizer, OCR technology itself, and flatbed scanner. Uh, and now, everyone is using it in some capacity or another. If you design technology to be accessible to the blind, it has serious crossover effect. And right now, blind people have access to handheld reading machines that we can carry around to gain access to printed text. That is the result of the innovation of the National Federation of the Blind. Uh, we go beyond education. I just want to mention this quickly. And some of you may be afraid, but don't be, because it's not going to happen anytime soon. We also try to and develop a car that blind people can drive. And we believe one day we will be able to do just that. That's the work of the National Federation of the Blind Jernigan Institute. And we do many, many more things than this, uh, which I'm not going to go into right now. You can reach out to me later. How else? Next slide, please. How else do we change the edu accessibility educational um, landscape? Now, we, in the recent year, National Federation of the Blind actually uh, have been advocating for accessibility in higher education for a very long time, but in recent years we have achieved remarkable uh, goals that we have set. Um, one of them is, of course, um, access, to, access to printed text. We have recently worked with the Association of American Publishers. We participated in the Accessibility and Metadata Working Group, and throughout uh, as a result, we ha the AAP has released the uh, EPA 3 um, implementation guideline that anybody who wants to study how to better utilize and adopt EPA 3 standards should be uh, looking at this guideline, and the URL is up on your uh, PowerPoint right now. We also introduced TEACH Act to the Congress. Um, TEACH Act is HR 3505. We believe that there is a serious gap between the knowledge and the know-how that the university procurement officers and uh, technology developers have about accessibility. We want to bridge this gap. And this TEACH Act will um, go a long way in further the understanding uh, between these two group of people. And the URL to learn more about the TEACH Act is up on your PowerPoint now. My team and I are work close, working closely with cloud productivity uh, tools manufacturers. We provide uh, feedback to manufacturers like Google and Apple and, and Microsoft constantly uh, to ensure that the products are usable uh, by the blind. and um, you know, it's, it's easier every day to talk about accessibility. Now, uh, not everything is perfect, but we have come a long way. Accessibility out, out of the box that's being adopted by uh, this giant company like Microsoft, Microsoft Google, and Apple uh, 
has come a long way to help the blind. They're not perfect, as I said, uh, but we have come a long way, so that's something to celebrate. Now, um, we also participated in the uh, AIM Commission that has been somewhat talked about. I'm going to skip over that. We, uh, in the past, have also bringing people together uh, in at a, a day-long, a two-day event, such as the um, in the inclusive inclusive publishing event. We have publishers and leaders in accessibility participated. 160 attendees from 23 countries come together in one place to talk about access uh, to printed text. I think this is huge. And I can go into more detail of what, about what we have been doing uh, to advocate for access in higher education, but I don't think time will allow for me to do that. Uh, so let's, let's go on to the next slide. I should say one more thing about this, though. Uh, this is really important because um, we don't we don't work in a vacuum, as I said. Um, we work with uh, other reading rights coalitions. Uh, the reading rights coalitions is uh, the collaborative effort by 30 nationally recognized organizations that represent those who cannot read print. And the member of the organization of the Reading Rights Coalition believes that um, access to the written word is the cornerstone of the education and democracy, and that new technologies must serve the individual with disability and not impede them. We, we believe in that as well. And we have worked very hard to advocate for um, access to printed text in with various, various alternative format and various um, access technologies like speech, speech synthesizers and Braille. We also have worked with the American uh, Library Association. And we, you know, the, the library have already passed a resolution to uh, require that the library materials and services provided through the library website would be equally accessible to people with disability and people without, which we wholeheartedly support. Next slide, please. So that's the bird's eye view of what's been going on. But how then do you actually make accessibility become a reality um, on your campus? I would like to present you with three angles to look at this. Um, we have the accessibility standard. We have usability testing by real people. And we also have uh, procurement. Um, procurement actually will probably have the, the, the um, one of the most important things that, that, that we need to patient, pay attention to because procurement has such a large impact on what's going on on campus. But I, I will uh, touch on that in a little bit later. With Next slide, please. I'm trying to finish up so I don't steal Jerry's time, you know. <laughs> accessibility standards. Uh, we these are some of the accessibility standards I see in your screen now that you uh, you probably are familiar with. But I just thought I uh, point them out to you for those of you who may be new to this area. Um, we, however, uh, advocate just like Luna said that it, the web content accessibility guideline is the best. Next slide, please. The web content accessibility guideline. Uh, for us, for people who have print disability, uh, WCAG 2 Proudly Double A is probably the best uh, minimum. Actually, the minimum compliance that we should we would want everybody who develops uh, technologies and products and services uh, for the blind to achieve. That will guarantee that majority of blind people can use uh, the system. Next slide, please. So procurement. Procurement, as I said, is really important. I, I, I would recommend that people who are in charge of procurement do not purchase any technology that are inaccessible. It's simple as that, right? Uh, and um, if you purchase technology that are accessible, that you will ensure that future accessibility problems are minimal. And there are people who have, who have done this right. 
uh, CSU has done right, uh, with especially with the um, the uh, Sac Sacramento campus, and also uh, we also have um, pretty decent uh, procurement language uh, from Penn State uh, settlement that the National Feder Federation of the Blind um, has made with Penn State. So you can look at the example of procurement language uh, from those. Uh, three sources that's listed in your PowerPoint. Next slide, please. Content creation is really important. Um, content creation, uh, you not in the you know, colleges and university, uh, professors of all levels are creating accessible, uh, creating content now. Those content need to be creating in an accessible manner. Um, document accessibility is extremely important here. Uh, you know, something as simple as marked up Word document appropriately or a marked up HTML document uh, with appropriate heading structures. Or if you do that, if you enforce this as uh, good practice, uh, then you can guarantee that your professor, uh, your students get, can, can gain access uh, to the content. We're not only talking about web content and uh, Word content, PowerPoint content, and Excel content. By the way, those uh, uh, content have accessibility guidelines that Microsoft actually doing a pretty nice job of laying it out. We also we also talked about talking about new type of instructional material content like graphics. Uh, uh, the um, Braille Authority of North America also have come out with pretty uh, great. Uh, Tactile graphics design guideline. So we should be taking a look at that. The uh, multimedia accessibility is also important this day, and NCAM has doing a very, very, very good job um, of uh, making public the guideline that content creators should follow. I just want to say quickly here um, that we also need to pay attention to uh, content that display on mobile devices. On campus, uh, you know, uh, both well, all three actually, Microsoft, Google, and Apple uh, have decent accessibility API that app developers can use to develop apps. Now, those of you who are in charge of procurement and selecting technology for uh, campus, you must realize that uh, having accessible out of the box PDA. It's not good enough. You gotta ensure that all of the apps that are used with those PDA are accessible as well. And when you talk to your app developers, uh, continue to talk to them about the accessible API and guideline that Google and Apple and Microsoft made available to them. And please hold them accountable that they would design accessible apps. Next slide for contact information, please. If you have any further uh, question for me, you can reach out to me. And I'll be glad to answer any questions uh, toward the end of the presentation as well. Jerry, I hope I didn't steal your time too much. Uh, well, um, thank you, um, Anne. And, and uh, I think I, I just want to reinforce important points um, that Anne made. And, and I want to continue on, too, is that NFB is a wonderful partner, and they can really provide you tremendous expertise. Uh, so I just want to encourage anyone out there to make sure you reach out to, to NFB. They, they, they really do wonderful things. And, and some of the, what I'll try to highlight, um, both what we're doing in the California State University system and also what we're trying to do in Merlot is really we re rely on the expertise um, in working uh, that NFB has provided us to help be successful. So um, it, and now I'll about the California State University, uh, we have an accessible technology initiative. And basically, through both policies, we've laid out that accessibility is everyone's job. Um, and and Anne's point about procurement as a critical area for an institution to develop policies and the training to ensure the procurement of technology includes an accessibility review is, is essential. And when you can begin to look at um, where are these high impact areas, it is kind of the, you know, what you are buying, 
as a baseline set of technologies, so the procurement process and it really becomes important. So here, you know, just reinforcing what, what we're doing in, in the Cal State system. And then when you work with vendors, many of them may not understand the needs that you have for your students, so working with them. And then how do you continue to assess your ability to do that, connect it with the people, and then you go back and say, okay, what did I learn? And now I've got to go change policies. And so we started in 2004, and we're on our third you know, evolution of a set of uh, strategies here. Now, um, this third kind of framework that, that we put together um, really the, is important beginning with uh, the idea of a continuous process improvement strategy. That wherever we are, acknowledge where, where you are and how do you make things better. And I just want to thank Cindy Rowland, the WebAIM folks for their goals project. They really laid out a framework that, that enabled the CSU to kind of put it into practice. So where we have every year we go through institutional assessment of where are our key areas that we need to make better um, and then how do we then support the campus to really implement that plan. Now our framework is available up on our website free for anyone to be able to use. And the key aspect that we lay out here, our major areas is kind of web accessibility. And as Anne has pointed out, procurement is essential. And then the instruction materials. And so when Anne talked about content creation and the use of instructional materials, really essential. So with these 22 goals across these different areas, we have individual success indicators. It makes it easy for people to say, where are we and where are the key areas that we need to really make measured improvement in what we're doing. So um, with that context of the institutional responsibility to ongoing improvement of accessibility, um, Merlot uh, has been around since 1997 providing uh, a open library for anyone, anywhere to have access to a whole variety of materials. Um, I'm uh, showing you here, this is a, we call it our, our student-centered site, MerlotX.org. And, uh, and it's where can you find free materials, online courses, open textbooks. And the other thing I just want to highlight here is we try to create a specific collection around where do you find the free materials that also have some accessibility information about those materials. Um, it's important that when you begin to look for materials, where is there information that lets you understand its ability um, on a whole variety of features, and I'll talk a little bit more about that, so you can understand how to make sure every student has uh, a quality educational experience and, um, and when Una talked earlier about um, the, the uh, support for evaluating open textbooks for accessibility, you can find that information. You just click on that link and, uh, and you'll be able to see where can I find open textbooks that have accessibility reviews with them. So in the Merlot X, that's, we, we try to help make it easy for you to make those choices for, for that information. Uh, the other thing we've been doing um, too as well with the Cal State system and Merlot is really um, uh, emphasizing universal design for learning. This is an important emphasis that Una made early on. And where do you find information about UDL, universal design for learning? And so we have the Cal State um, system along with Merlot creating this resource, again, that's available and open for you to use. Now, one of the things that um, can be a challenge um, is, uh, like, the, uh, where do you find all these uh, document, um, documents to help you build accessible PowerPoints, uh, Word, um, Excel? We have on the website um, and put those lists. But if you often don't know where that list is, where can you go to try to find a library of all these type of materials. And this is what we've tried to do. Una gave a screenshot of this earlier. 
uh, kind of the alliance of the Cal State system, Merlot, OCW, NFB, is to try to build a place, kind of build a one-stop shop and a community for you to, if you're looking for um, accessible o, you know, uh, OER, um, we try to, you know, where can you go look for this? If I have to create materials, how do I author materials so it's accessible? Where can I go to find organizations like WebAIM, NFB, et cetera, who can help me do some evaluation and assessment of my accessibility? We want you to join our community, Merlot, as an open educational service center. Um, you can find other people who have accessibility expertise. And, we, uh, and if you want to contribute your expertise, we have mechanisms for doing that. And uh, the OER Access Newsstand, this is really a collection of RSS feeds where you can find out information. What's new in, um, in uh, accessibility and, and OER? Trying to make it, again, easy for you to find this information uh, for, uh, to aid your planning and your support for accessibility in your institution. And um, again, just highlighting these things, you, where you can find resources, experts, organizations, where you can find materials, join a community. And, uh, and one of the things we've started building into Merlot is a mechanism for people to share when they're using open education resources, how can you share your knowledge of the accessibility of those resources. And uh, what I'm going to highlight here, within the Merlot library, we have added a whole set of um, kind of accessibility um, metadata or descriptions that the community can bring their expertise together and share that. So what we have in Merlot, our goals is how do we promote the use of accessible information when you're looking at OER? So we have a metadata or descriptive framework and provide you tools to help you search and find enable experts who do have that expertise around accessibility to contribute it so collectively we can build um, kind of more accessible OER for, for us to share. And what I'll do next is just highlight um, some of our checkpoints. We have 32 checkpoints in 15 areas, and it may sound like a lot, but if you take it bit by bit, piece by piece, you can uh, begin to build a quality collection of OER that also has information about the accessibility of those resources. And I'm going to highlight some easy ways for, for you to begin to check some critical features of accessibility using tools. And on Firefox, there's a Wave toolbar and a Web Developer toolbar. And I'll, again, just highlight some simple things that help if you're using open education resources, check for accessibility aspects and then contribute it back so everyone else can take advantage of that information in their OER selection. So I'm going to highlight right now within Merlot, if you have a piece of material, you can make um, kind of, uh, you can say, is there any policy or a statement about accessibility or sport that, that's on that website? So if a student is having problems, where can they go in, to get their questions answered, right? Other aspects, and this is about the accessibility of uh, a resource, is the text available to assistive technologies? And I think the, the point that Anne has made about NFB pushing the envelope around assistive technologies is essential, and there's tremendous advances going on, but you want to make sure those resources that are, are actually readable with uh, um, assistive technologies. Issues about reading order, layout, structural markup, and I'll have some highlights around that to allow simpler navigation, more efficient navigation is really essential. Tables becomes a huge accessibility issue, and when you can look at is the markup on those tables um, useful. And so what we try to do in Merlot, just highlighting here, there are a number of areas where people with expertise can start adding information about the accessibility, color, language, the images, do they have alt tags of descriptions of what those are, multimedia, flickering, stem, 
um, and interactive elements. So within the Merlot database, so when you find materials, you can do accessibility reviews and contribute it back to the collection so that um, we can all benefit from knowledge about the accessibility of OER. Just a few more slides here. Um, and I'll just give you an example here. At the bottom, you can see here's a in Firefox a wave toolbar, and there's a simple feature of asking you to kind of re really reveal the headings that are in um, a resource. And so here's an example within Merlot. You can find something called DNA from the beginning, and when you run uh, the outline tool, you can see there is headings in this website that will allow, um, uh, for example, a student uh, who has um, uh, a visual impairment can navigate through the headings quickly through this area to get the information that they want in a much more efficient way. Now I'll pull up another resource that you can find in Merlot, Biology Tutorial About Cell, and you can see this is a case where there's no structural markup. And so someone, a blind student, for example, having to navigate, they would have to actually l listen to all the different co you know, content here to get to what they may want in kind of genetics and imitation. Right? So structural markup can really provide an important tool for students um, with disabilities. Another example is images. Um, and, uh, and with the um, web developer uh, toolbar, uh, within Firefox, I'll just show an example here. Once again, DNA from the beginning. There's a um, you have uh, images in here, and you have alt tags that describe what those images are. So um, so a student who's blind can get an understanding of the information being communi communicated on that website. Other images. For example, here's one um, about uh, cell metabolism. This has no alt tags, so a student uh, who, um, who is blind really wouldn't have access to this material for their learning. So these are some of the simple things that you can check for the accessibility of OER, and Merlot provides you a mechanism is once you check it, contribute it back to the collection so other people can have information about this. Because the purpose behind Merlot is really looking at these challenges that each of us as an individual feels, like how can I change the world uh, of digital content to now make it much more accessible for all. And the way we can do that is we try to do in Merlot is to create a mechanism where collectively we can work together with uh, OCWC with the NFB and with your institutions to build a collection of resources that's accessible and to really build an, an accessible digital world. So with that, um, uh, I'm done with my section and so I'll turn it back over to uh, Una who will uh, moderate the uh, Sorry, the had to turn my microphone back on. Thank you, Jerry and, and Anne for um, not only uh, so much wonderful information about accessibility and the need for that, but also your invitation to our audience today to participate with us in supporting learners with disabilities and diverse needs. Um, we are open for questions now. Um, one question that was asked a little earlier, uh, Rick asked um, a question about, are there any particular tools which enhance learning management systems? Um, and such as LTI uh, that you found to be best, and he gave an example here called Read Speaker. Ann, are you familiar with uh, Read Speaker? I am. I am not. Uh, I don't have extensive knowledge in Read Speaker, but I certainly would be glad to look into it. Um, and you work with a lot of uh, learning management system developers, though, to to make sure that they're accessible. Would you mind uh, just telling us a little bit about that work? I think it would be of a, a lot of interest. I'll be glad to. I hope you can hear me okay. Um, 
I work with two companies, my team and I, and um, they are Blackboard and Desire to Learn, as shown in the previous slides. Uh, Desire to Learn is able to achieve um, our certification for multiple years because I, I think there are three gaps uh, for companies to implement accessibility well. These three things must, must happen. They need to have a support uh, for accessibility implementation across the organization, and that support and that, le that leadership will have to come from the top. And John Baker from Desire to Learn, who's the C Z CEO of Desire to Learn, is really committed to, to accessibility. He and I actually just made a presentation together at uh, Southwest, uh, South by Southwest EDU on um, uh, higher ed accessibility. So it's really refreshing to me is to see a CEO that really embraces accessibility so much. So much so that he hired a blind individual uh, who understand access technology uh, to to be a, a part of his uh, product development team. That says a lot about the company. Uh, another thing that we should keep in mind uh, um, is that not only uh, the CEO of the company need to be uh, supportive in this, but uh, people within the company need to be passion, passionate about it. And guess what? You, you college uh, and universities procurement officer, you need to start demanding accessibility. We need you to be on our side to create the right momentum for the industry. Uh, thank you, Ann. Um, Jerry, we had a question here for you. Um, Andrea asked um, about if you um, use an OER um, and you discover an accessibility issue and then fix it, um, should you have put a note to that effect in the original resource and also put the item back as modified? Uh, great. Um, and uh, hi, Andrea. Yeah, great point. And I just backed up to a, a few slides. Um, and I'll say that, that there's two aspects. One is, um, Simply, if you've done an evaluation of an open education resource, simply putting that evaluation and let's say if, if there are no alt images, uh, sorry, alt tags on the images, you can put that in. Or if there is, you can kind of use, you do some of these check boxes to say, yep, non-decorative non images. So, so some of this could just be um, including information about the accessibility as the item is. Right? Now, the second point you're making is if that open education resource is kind of, uh, I'll say, um, uh, re you can remix in a sense. That, that is, you can go in there and actually change the, the uh, content and its um, really presentation, then yes, it would be great to then once you create a new version, you can catalog that in Merlot and then click on or check off how that new material is much it has improved accessibility. Because um, one of the challenges um, is that when people present materials around open education, it, they'll say, um, what is it, the content area, what type of material it is, but there really hasn't been an evaluation of the uh, what we call you kind know, of these uh, accessibility elements of digital materials, and that's kind of what's what we put in the Merlot framework um, to help people guide, you know, in um, in simple language, uh, you know, around language, color, contrast, images, stuff like that. So, so what we again, what Merlot tries to do is just provide a mechanism for you to share what you've done, so other people um, can benefit from it. Um, was that helpful, Andrea? Yeah. Okay. Great. Um, we had a question also uh, from Jim Heater, um, who was asking, uh, "Are there any accessibility tools or resources for people with dyslexia, other than audio materials?" And uh, thank you, Rick, for sharing um, a link in the chat window there. Um, I don't know if anybody else wants to um, speak about tools for dyslexia. Um, I know we actually had. Uh, 
an interesting session on this about two hours ago about except, uh, um, dyslexia in modern language learning, um, which is another open ed webinar that uh, folks can check out the archive in a few days. Um, Um, Una, I'll just make a, a quick comment. Um, Jim, I, I don't have any other information uh, of, uh, for myself that, that I know about, but um, the URL that, that, that you put in there, um, right now it's in a, um, you know, it's in our chat, but one of the things what we want to do, um, you know, uh, all of us here is to say, if you have information about um, and it could be uh, around authoring accessible materials using different tools, or there could be information about, um, you know, uh, materials that are good for uh, students with, with, with dyslexia because they've used certain tools or whatever it might be. Um, I think thinking about um, contributing into the community's library so we all can go find it easily. So, so that's that's my. Um, encouragement for you to, to think about how you might be able to, if you do have that expertise around dyslexia and accessibility and digital resources, finding a way to contribute it into the below collection. And, it, and if it doesn't fit anywhere, just shoot me an email and, and we'll find a way to make the adjustments to the library to make it easier for you to do that. All right, thank you, Jerry. And I also, Jim, I will post a link to uh, the webinar that happened two hours ago about dyslexia um, and OER. All right. Um, I, I'm not seeing any other questions at this point, um, but we'll be here for a few more minutes. So I want to give Anne and Jerry um, uh, f a final chance for uh, comments um, to share with us. And um, Anne, I'm going to let you go first if you'd like to make any closing comments. I think that um, all of us must truly believe that accessibility is achievable. And I think we all do. Otherwise, we probably wouldn't be having this conversation. So I appreciate your willingness and your attention to pursue this. And I, again, want to repeat that we're not working in isolation. We have people who are truly committed. We have the community, the blind community behind us, and we'll work alongside you to help you achieve uh, accessibility. Um, there's a point that I think I've missed in my presentation concerning VPAT or um, Volunteer Product Accessibility Template. Um, some people use VPAT as a foundation to uh, evaluate accessibility. I would urge that those of you who make procurement decisions go beyond that. If there's anything at all that you uh, get from this presentation, I hope you realize the significance of real usability testing with real people using real access technology. Uh, as an example, blind. Uh, users using screen access software or refreshable braille display uh, to evaluate the ed tech products or services that you want to offer. That certainly is not a, it, it cannot be replaced. Uh, if, if the products aren't usable by the blind, then it doesn't matter what kind of, how, how well written the, the VPAT is. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Anne. There, there was one final question in here, uh, Jerry, that I wanted to direct at you. Um, it's from Chet Caldwell um, from Open University, and she says, regarding procurement, how can we promote accessibility when budgets are so tight and cheaper products are, you, are less accessible? Jerry, can you respond to that one? Sure, be, be happy to. Um, and, uh, and let me just say, um, in uh, for the last five year, four years, the CSU has lost 30 percent of its state operating expenses. Um, it's been horrible. Uh, the Great Recession has greatly impacted our budget. Yet, um, we implemented accessibility and continuously improve it because I think you have to um, realize that. Um, 
ex uh, the, the cost of products and the accessibility of products is um, are not um, always correlated. Just you know, just you know, it's not always it's not more expensive. When you think about the total cost of what it takes to serve these students, um, it, it, it becomes essential to build accessibility into the procurement process. And, and I put a, uh, a link in there to the Cal State's um, Accessible Technology Initiative. There's some information about procurement. And the key um, is around how do you build procurement, uh, uh, how do you build accessibility into your procurement guidelines? Um, and, uh, and to ensure that when your vendors are presenting you with their product, they actually demonstrate the accessibility. And I want to reinforce Anne's point around uh, VPADS, Voluntary Product Accessibility Templates. Um, you have to make sure um, that what is the real accessibility it requires validating the features of that accessibility. So when you do procurement, put the burden on the vendor to demonstrate their accessibility using, um, um, using your procurement process. The procurement process is the point you can leverage work on the vendor to prove to you how it works. Um, and, and I think the other aspect is um, there are a lot of things, and fortunately within the CSU, we can leverage our size to get contracts um, that if you are accessible, you can um, really uh, do more business with the CSU. So, so that's another driver um, to lower the cost of those products if they understand that um, they can do more business with, with you. Um, uh, but I, I think um, uh, accessibility doesn't mean more expensive. Um, uh, I, I think that, that's kind of the, the issue you, you want to try to get around. And there are policies and procedures to help guide you. And I, and I hope that um, Cal State website can provide you some uh, useful guidance along these areas. Um, and I'll, I'll just check. I know we're at the end here. I, if, I hope that was helpful for you. Thank you, Jerry. I, 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 it was helpful for me, and I hope it was for our audience as well. Um, uh, yeah, and Chet's, Chet's um, also. And I think, as Jerry's point was, if you take the long-term view of accessibility, um, it, being accessible up front is, is, is always less expensive. Um, and it doesn't open you up to um, various litigation as well. <laughs> so I want to thank everyone for coming today. Um, and I hope that you found this useful. Um, I know I certainly did. And I want to thank Anne. Taylor from the National Federation of the Blind and Jerry Hanley from the California State University System. Um, this was a, a, a wonderful presentation and it will be available. We'll be archiving that uh, for so that you can share this with your colleagues who were not able to make it today. And I am going to turn off the recorder at this point. So goodbye everyone and thanks again.